welcome to the Housing Finance and Policy Committee. I'd like to call to order um, our, our committee for the day. It's February 22nd at about 1.05. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, members, today we are going to continue our, our overview of the board members for the agency and then uh, go into the supplemental budget for the governor. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Commissioner Ho uh, to introduce our, our first uh, member and give a broad overview. Uh, great, uh, Chairman Dreheim and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Ho and I'm the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Uh, great to be back with you today. I am here um, with two, uh, possibly three <laughs> of my board members today. Uh, Craig Clausing has been on the board uh, uh, for quite a while. And so he has some historic perspective that predates me. And uh, Stephen Spears is one of our newer board members. For folks from the public who are uh, watching today who maybe worked with us on Tuesday and Thursday of last week, Minnesota Housing is kind of unique among state agencies because uh, we're a government or governmental entity that's independent from the rest of the state enterprise and we're governed by a board of directors. Um, as commissioner, I have administrative authority, but the management and control of the agency is vested in the board. Uh, we have seven members, six are public members who are appointed by the governor, and the seventh seat is the state auditor, Julie Blaha. I um, finance housing finance agencies across the country tend to be uh, independently governed uh, because of uh, the unique financial arrangements that we have for raising money. Uh, in uh, the capital markets and the obligations that we have to bondholders. I, um, I just need to say that, uh, uh, you know, I just really feel fortunate to have the board of directors uh, that I have. I, um, they are small but mighty and they do an incredible amount of work. They meet monthly uh, as well as, uh, as, as uh, committee meetings. And oftentimes I come to them with a board packet that's one or 200 pages of detail around various uh, uh, financial arrangements that we have with housing developers. And, uh, and I have a board that always does their homework and they always ask good questions. And so with that, I think, uh, I know that Stephen has a, a, a tight timeline today, uh, but I know that you have also uh, enjoyed in the previous hearings kind of asking the board members who are appearing together the same questions to answer together. So I think that I would just uh, suggest, uh, Chairman, if you can, is just to make sure that Stephen knows when it is that it's okay for him to leave. And with that, I'll turn it over to Craig and Stephen. And I'll be standing by in case there are any additional questions that come up for me. Thank you, Commissioner Ho. And I, I, I do understand uh, Mr. Spears has uh, time commitments. Uh, so why don't we start with him and we can ask him uh, all, all the questions so he can and move on. But uh, Mr. Spears, if you could uh, start by uh, introducing yourself and uh, we'll, we'll have a few questions when you're done. Well, thank you, Chairman. And I appreciate the uh, opp opportunity to join this afternoon. And, and um, I know I won't get a chance to directly meet all of you, but to everyone out there, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, and again, just uh, happy to have the opportunity to introduce myself and share a bit of my background. So as uh, Commissioner Ho did, indicate I am, I think I have the honor of being the newest board member. I know that I joined, I think, roughly right at the two-year mark now. So most of my experience has been, you know, through the virtual experience here. So I, I have continued, so I haven't had the opportunity actually to work elbow to elbow or physically elbow to elbow with every board member, but certainly virtually elbow to elbow. And I can vouch for the fact that uh, there are many times, as Commissioner Hull said, that we do get 100 to 200 pages of detail that we have to work through. And we do that uh, quite effectively and efficiently um, through the virtual uh, means. My background um, is, is really, I would say, probably quite a bit different than most of the board members. I haven't really been involved in uh, I've said my back, my board experience has come from the, the I would say, nonprofit sector, um, but so haven't really been that involved from a government standpoint uh, on boards or, or positions or anything of that nature. My background is uh, from the banking world. I've, I came to 
Minnesota in 1991, I believe it is. And, and from that point, have kind of worked with a number of different financial institutions within the Twin Cities, including US Bank, um, so smaller organizations, um, family owned community banks. Um, and currently working with uh, Brimmer Bank at this time. And so I have a long history in banking, which I would suspect is uh, Commissioner Hull's um, reason for wanting me on the board, understanding that a lot of what we do within the agency is banking related activities. And, and my specific expertise in banking is really in that capital market space. So the issuance of debt um, and how that is placed in the, in the private sector or in the, in the, in the markets. And so that is probably the area that I've enjoyed most to date is learning more about how the agency works from that aspect. I've also gained just an appreciation for the broadness of the organization. Um, through banking, I also, as I said, my specific area of expertise is really in the capital market space, but that has certainly led into mortgage securitization and really leading some of our mortgage areas, whether it be with Brimmer Bank or with US Bank or some of the smaller community banks I work with. And so I've always had a long history with the agency through the single family side. So my, my experience and depth of experience with the agency has come from the single family um, side of the, of the agency. Uh, once joining the board, I really see now just how broad the organization is and really have come up to speed and understanding the other areas of the, or of the, organ, of the organization or the agency and just how intricate and how detailed the work is that we have to do. Um, and so, as I said, I think that I come to the board with uh, quite a bit of experience in, uh, in banking. Um, I've certainly been able to, I think, utilize that experience and understanding how we work as an agency, um, but also have appreciated what I have been able to learn from the other areas of the agency as well. Um, and just understanding the vastness uh, and the reach that the organization or the agency has within the state. So I will probably close my remarks by saying it's been a very fast two years that I have been here. I've enjoyed getting to know my fellow board members uh, virtually and look forward to getting to know them one day here soon um, in a physical environment. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments. I, I guess we'll, we'll go right to the questions. I, I know you do have time constraints. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, well, that was, I apologize. Okay. Um, I guess, Senator Duckworth, do you have a question? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, well, first off, uh, welcome. And the question I have for you is, what do you believe MH, uh, MHFA does well to promote home ownership? And what are some ways we can improve our promotion of uh, home ownership? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I appreciate the question. That's one that I feel like I, I am... Um, qualified to answer uh, and just knowing the, the newness of my board position here. But as I said, I have a lot of experience with the agency on the single family and the housing side, uh, home ownership side. I would say that what I've noticed in the two years that I've been with the agency as a board member, but prior to that, is this an organ, a financial institution that engaged with the agency on many levels? Uh, I would say what the agency has always done well is engage with the community. Uh, I know that my first encounter with the commissioner was meeting her at an, at an organ, a community organization event centered around home ownership. I know that all the members of the single family team are very well known and well respected within the community and throughout the state as it pertains to home ownership. And there is a huge partnership that I know that every financial institution feels and really everyone involved in that home ownership process, whether it be through other community agencies, whether it be real realtors or bankers or loan officers, there is a direct engagement with all, all areas of that chain that really pulls together to create that home ownership. And so I would say by far and away, the thing that we do the best is engage with the community and understand the needs and try to react to those needs. Beyond that, the programs and the execution of the programs, understanding that through the bank that I work with now, we work with three different agencies, whether that's through the um, Minnesota Housing or WIDA on the Wisconsin side or in North Dakota as well, we work with all three agencies. 
and and not uh, to be partial with any of the three, but I just know that the level of engagement and the level of understanding of what is out there from what from the education side of the world, the direct program aspects of it, it is vastly different in Minnesota than it is in Wisconsin and North Dakota. So I believe that that direct engagement um, that occurs with the agency in all areas that are impacted, uh, that impact that housing or that home ownership chain or value chain there is, is much deeper in Minnesota than it is in some of those other states. So that's by far and away what I would say um, is the best thing that the agency does. So I don't know if Craig has a other thoughts there or if you'd just like for me to continue to answer some questions. Well, we'll just keep on going with you okay. and, and then we'll ask him later. We're just, we're asking all the same questions to all the, sure. all the members. So um, the next question would be, how often do you meet with stakeholders regarding uh, programming and then which stakeholders? Yeah, so but I'll answer that by saying that I, I meet with stakeholders all the time um, and that's a, that's a benefit that I have is that I can do that both as a board member, but also within my position. So currently here at Bremer, I am responsible for our affordable, affordable lending, our CRA activities. Uh, and so that is part of my job that I have to do now is in, engage with the community organizations that I feel can be beneficial or can be supported by our organization. So I'm often in the community, often engaging with these stakeholders that I've referenced in the previous answer. So I, I, as I said, I get the benefit of being able to do that to solve for my current responsibilities and my role here at Brimmer, but then it also serves as a benefit as the board member of the agency. So I'm gonna go off script here just a little bit. So just a, a fair warning. Uh, we're uh, um, really pushing different affordable housing uh, ideas uh, in, in our committee. And, and one thing that we really try to look at are, are kind of the on the lower end of affordability, um, which is manufactured homes mm -hmm. and the financing of them. And we know, I know, for, I think it was New Hampshire had uh, set up a program uh, for the state to finance them uh, any thoughts on, on that area, uh, anything we can do here um, as a committee to try to push that uh, affordability home ownership um, of manufactured homes? And I, and I know it's different if, if you own the land underneath, et cetera. I, I get the chattel um, yeah. argument, I guess. But um, any, any thoughts on that or any ideas you could give us? Well, you know, I, again, I will answer that and I, I will honestly probably answer that more as a banker than as the board member of the, of the agency. And so I just would kind of put that precursor out there. Uh, and with that, I also kind of throw myself, you know, on, under the gauntlet there. There needs to be an education within the financial services world of getting off of the idea of a manufactured home um, being something like what we used to know it. So I know that there are there are huge communities, you know, being organized now that that are through manufactured housing. That if you look at them, you would not be able to determine that there was a community determined that was built as manufactured housing, and the people don't own the land underneath that 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 chattel. So I think that we have a lot of learning to do as an industry to get off of our historical beliefs and and mental models of what it means to be manufactured housing. So I think that education is going to be the biggest thing and just understanding and promoting the value. And I think it's essential because as you're saying, I think it's going to be key to affordable housing. We won't be able to continue to have affordable housing without looking at that space. So I know that that's something that internally I look at here and trying to understand um, if our partners that we sell loans to in terms of the government sponsored entities, the GSEs are not willing to make wholesale changes as it pertains to their ability to purchase and securitize manufacture housing, then organizations like ours have to be able to be comfortable with putting those on the portfolio. 
And with all of that said, that also creates a huge opportunity for us at the agency to look further into that and, and continue to kind of build on the things that we already, I, I know, are working on and thinking about and talking about in that space as well. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of discussion on that topic. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know where the state fits in. We, we've uh, tried to push, push some ideas uh, on that, you know, and, and I don't know if, uh, if you have ideas down the road, if you could share that with us, we would really appreciate it. You know, if, if the state could set up a program where maybe they guarantee uh, part of the note um, that, that might help push some lenders into that space uh, at an affordable rate. I, I know there are some lenders that are in it, and I understand that the rates would be higher than the traditional stick built for the most part, right. because there is more risk. Um, but it would be nice if we could, we could do better. So I, I have one last question for you. Um, having to do with rent help and the rent help program. So how would you rate the performance of the rent help program? And what do you think we could do to improve it? if we set up another program. Sure. Um, and this is one that I, I will you know, right away again, precursor here, say that I don't know that I'm 100% qualified because I haven't been able to ex have a lot of experience with other programs, how we stood them up, how they worked. Um, what I can say is that as I, as a board member, understanding that this opportunity came up um, and it was a significant undertaking to stand up in a short amount of time so that we can impact the number of people. Um, and I know that from a board member, our level of information and understanding that was thorough. Um, we, we certainly had sufficient conversation and understanding of how to stand this up, always with the goal in mind of helping as many people as we possibly can. Um, at the end of the day, I think that I would judge our performance on being able to do that as um, strong, given the fact that I know that we did have that opportunity to help a number of people. As areas in terms of improving, I, I don't know that I, I can say that I know just from enough about the agency, about how we stand up these things to be able to speak to what we could do, what we could have done better, or what we could do better, or could have done better. Um, I just know that what I felt like we were Given the fact that this was something very new to me and my level of understanding of it and the decisions that were made, I feel like we, the performance was strong uh, on, the, on the rent help. And I just don't know that I know enough to be able to be critical in the sense of saying, we could do this better, um, or this could have been done better. Um, so I'm gonna probably have to defer that, um, I guess I'd say not level of critique, but that constructive criticism to Craig who probably has had uh, numerous experiences rolling out very intricate and, and complicated programs like rent help. Thank you, um, Mr. Spears, for your time and your answering our questions for us. Uh, any other questions, members? Um, so thank you. I, I think we will continue on uh, with um, Mr. Clossing. I hope I'm saying your name right. At least it's not Jill anymore. Um, but uh, if you want to introduce yourself and, and uh, give us a, a, a background, uh, that would be wonderful. And then we'll have the same questions for you. Sure. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Um, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I was, I've been practicing yours as well. I, I think I, I accept a, a whole range of clausing. I think it's probably the way it was pronounced originally. And we say clausing. Um, but any of those are good. So thanks so much for allowing me to be here today. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to do this by Zoom. I was really hoping to be able to come in, but I actually have someplace to be later this afternoon too. Now, given the weather, I'm extremely grateful that I didn't have to drive down, um, even though it's not too far of a drive from my house. Um, so to introduce myself um, professionally, my background is a lawyer. Uh, I'm retired. Um, prior to that, I practiced as a staff attorney with the Office of Lawyers Professional Responsibility. I was there for 23 years. My work there uh, involved investigating and prosecuting attorney disciplinary cases on behalf of the director's office. Uh, before that, I was with a private firm uh, in Minneapolis, 
Uh, my educational background, I have a JD in, in uh, law from the Lynn Mitchell College of Law, or then Lynn Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota. I suspect more relevant to the panel's consideration, or the committee's consideration, uh, my background is I have a long history of involvement with uh, housing issues. Uh, I grew up in Roseville, which is where I live currently. Um, and when I moved back to the community, um, I wanted to get involved. Um, I, I'd been away for a few years and I volunteered for something called Imagine Roseville 2000, which tells you how long ago that was because this was picturing Roseville in the year 2000 in the future. Uh, and they set up a number of citizen uh, commission study groups uh, as a result of that process. And one of them was a group that looked specifically at housing. And that was really my first introduction to housing issues on kind of a systemic uh, way and, and looking at the whole pattern of a housing market and housing in a community. Uh, so that led, as these things often do, that led to my being involved on the Roseville Planning Commission. So I served a number of years on the Planning Commission, including a couple as its chair. Again, got to learn about housing issues and related issues of zoning and land use and, and things of that type. Um, one of the council members moved out of the community. Uh, I was appointed to fill the remainder of his term and I was elected in my own right. I served a, a term on, as a council member and then I was elected and served two terms as mayor. And again, uh, as a mayor dealing with a lot of housing issues, you know, housing is really crucial to the economic well-being, well, of the entire state, but as a mayor, you know, your focus is your particular city. Um, and, and that really drove home for me and deepened my understanding of the importance of housing issues. Just if I may, just one quick um, example, we had an old apartment complex in Roseville called Harmar Apartments. If you're familiar with Roseville, you know, Harmar Mall. And they had been, they were well past their prime and nonprofit came in and was interested in redeveloping them. Um, we did that. Um, we took a property that had been the scene of a lot of um, police calls and, and trouble and rundown buildings and turned it into a real asset to the community and converted that to, to affordable housing. So um, that's my, my background. Um, I, I think I was, and stop me, Senator, if you, if you like. I know, I think there was a couple of questions that Mr. Hansen mentioned, also my kind of my goals for the agency and then some of my experience with the board, would you like me to speak to those or would you like to go directly no, to the you're, question? No, you're, you're doing great. If you wanna to speak to them, that would be wonderful. Sure. Well, the, the short answer is always for housing is more, more of it. You know, there's not a, there is not a sufficient amount of housing in the state as I'm sure uh, members of the committee know. And that shortage of housing has a lot of negative uh, impacts. It, it harms our ability as a state to be economically competitive um, it drives up housing costs and pushes people who are maybe on the margin of being able to afford housing um, into homelessness, potentially. Uh, it, it means seniors, for example, may not have the options that they, uh, they really need to be able to move to different types of housing so they can age in place or to be close to healthcare providers. So um, short goal I like to see more of is, is housing across the board. Uh, more specifically though, uh, Preserving the housing we have, I'm sure the committee's heard the term and people have talked about naturally occurable, occurring affordable housing, something that's not specifically constructed, but because of age and location serves the purpose of being affordable. Um, you get a lot more bang for your buck uh, dollars invested in preserving that afford naturally occurring affordable housing. So uh, that would be a goal. Um, third, and I know there's a, I heard a question about this coming up, the support and encourage home ownership. I think that's an important goal. Uh, and then also to increase uh, housing stability to help people um, stay in their homes. So sometimes it's not just building homes, but it's programming and supporting things where, uh, let's say, someone with a mental health issues can receive supportive services and housing, or a senior um, can can stay in their own homes because there are services available. Um, so those are some, uh, you know, some of the goals I like to see for the agency. And and those are things I should clarify things the agency is pursuing, um, but I'd like to see us you know, continue our efforts in those regards. I think uh, there'd be a good return for the state um, with more work in those areas. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, thank you. Um, we, do, we do have some pre, um, 
draft questions. If, if you're ready for those, we could go to uh, Senator Duckworth. He looks right. like he's very, very excited to ask you these <laughs> I'm excited to be asked. Always, always. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for being with us this afternoon. You, you kind of touched on the first one, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, what can the agency, what does the agency do well to promote home ownership? What can it do better? And then second would be uh, what stakeholders regarding the agency's programming do you meet with uh, and which stakeholders are they? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Um, I think we do, well, first, if I, if I may kind of, because I think I'd be remiss but on addressing this, um, home ownership obviously is a part of what we do, but we're a housing finance agency. So we do you know, housing in all sorts of different um, areas. So we do you know, funding for programs, as I mentioned, naturally occurring affordable housing, um, programs that help con do construction of homes that are affordable, um, rental assistance, help people stay in their homes, uh, housing links that um, help provide supportive services to keep people housed. Uh, so those are things I think we, we do well relating to housing, specifically as to home ownership, which is an important, um, important goal. Um, there are a couple of programs which I, I watched. I had the benefit of watching some of the earlier testimony that a couple people mentioned, but the startup program for first time home buyers uh, that assists with down payment. I think that's a, something we do well to get people into housing, homeowner education, uh, that helps support home ownership. And, and again, if I may, just a little personal aside, I had the benefit, my parents were property owners, owned their own house, as did my grandparents. And so when I was considering buying my first house, I called my dad and he came and, and you know, walked through the house with me and told me some things to look for. And if you don't have that you know, benefit, that experience to rely on, you're, you're at a disadvantage. And it was something I didn't even give a second thought to, but I realize now, was beneficial. So programs that you know, bridge that gap. Um, also, my wife's family was able to help us out with our down payment. We bought our first house. You know, so programs that help um, um, buy down or, or make homes more affordable, uh, help with home ownership. Um, uh, I think those are some of the things that we do well. What could we do, be doing better? Uh, I think reaching out and, and working more. Uh, and again, not that we're not doing this, but working with stakeholder groups, um, uh, segments of the market that have traditionally been shut out of, of home ownership. Uh, as I said, if you, your family's never owned property, the whole thing may be a bit of a mystery. So uh, that sort of education and programming, and, and I think one of the other board members talked about credit scores. You know, Some people don't completely understand how their credit score operates and, and, and some of the uh, homeowner education helps them appreciate, you know, there are some small things you can do to really help raise your credit score to make you, enable you to qualify for a mortgage. So uh, those are some things we could do. Uh, as the stakeholders, uh, I, I will say, given COVID, I, I'm not meeting with a lot of people uh, in any capacity, but um, we still, you know, communicate with um, uh, stakeholders. I get calls on occasion from um, developers, um, Nonprofits. I just had a call a few weeks ago about a, um, some questions about how the process worked, how it came to the board, what you know, what's what's the board involvement in these things. We do that. Um, I also think you know that our stakeholders include um, people who are taking advantage of our homes, so uh, the homes that the agency helps construct. So my wife and I volunteer uh, Dorothy Day, which is just a few blocks from where you're all located, the Dorothy Day Center, and serve meals there. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, the Housing Finance Agency was involved in helping to fund part of the, the housing structure. You know, we don't do shelters, we do housing, but part of that uh, facility now has uh, rooms that, that uh, people can rent on a short-term basis. I th this was the program a few years ago, I, I presume is still the same. The money you pay in rent, it's a nominal amount, but that, that goes when you're ready to move on to different housing, um, um, you, you get that back as a to be used for a deposit or your first few months rent. So meeting with, with uh, stakeholders in that way is really makes the work real and meaningful. It's one thing to sit at a meeting and get a report about a project that you're gonna, the agency's gonna be funding, but they actually talk to people who made that move, who are living there. Um, we also volunteer, there's something called uh, Interfaith Action, which is a group, a faith group in Interfaith Action of Greater St. Paul. And it's a, uh, organization of churches and faith uh, organizations, not just churches uh, in the St. Paul area. And they 
host something called Project Home, which helps house people uh, or shelter people who are temporarily homeless uh, over the evening and they, they cater to families. And again, going there and meeting people and talking to them about housing and how they're impacted by either the lack of housing or how being able to access homes now has really changed their lives. Uh, I find that all very, very meaningful. So that's my opportunity to, to do that. So I jump right into how I'd rate rent help men. I know that's the next one coming. <laughs> yes, well, you're, you're is, a right? mind reader. Well, I had the benefit of sitting through Stephen's, Stephen's questions. Um, I thought it actually, I would rate it highly. Um, and the reason I say this is because I think sometimes we lose the perspective of what's happening. We're, we're taking a program that we're creating out of whole cloth and getting that thing up and running um, and getting money to people out the door and to look at the numbers, the applications, you know, I think they doubled from November to December and doubled again in January um, was really, uh, I think, quite, uh, quite a success story. Um, sometimes we have a perspective, particularly um, you know, we're looking at things that have been done before um, and you have a lot of experience with, um, there's, a, there's a heightened expectation, but creating something um, from scratch, like Rent Help Men um, was a really a big lift. And I thought the agency did a really good job with that. And I know people were working incredibly long hours. Uh, I mean, the, the chair, or excuse me, the commissioner talks about the, the large packets the board gets. And yeah, we, we get some large packets sometimes and we have some extra meetings, but the level of work that we're doing, you know, is really small compared to the work that staff is doing and particularly as it relates to Rent Help Minnesota to get that program up uh, and operating. Um, what we can do, but I think one of the, the benefits is being through that exercise. I'm hoping that there isn't another pandemic and we don't have to create some program, um, go from zero to 60 immediately. Um, but if there are additional funds available for this, I, I think we've learned you know, how, to, how to process, how to set this program up. And I think we can be more efficient, um, or I know we can be in a, in a second go around. Uh, I suppose one thing that would be better that's not within our control, again, is a little more lead time and what's happening. And, and I know there was some delays. I serve on another board relating to housing uh, and I, I may be confusing too, but I know they had some issues administering funds because the federal guidelines you know, were, were evolving because this went through Congress so fast that they're trying to play catch up in terms of, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that we're administering this program consistent with what the feds uh, are expecting of us? Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you for your perspective. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Chair? Yeah. Or, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, um, I don't know if you were going to ask, but if I could about manufactured homes, I would love to yes. have 30 yes, seconds please. on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's a manufactured home park in Roseville, and I have to say, my education and my perspective on this has gone 180 degrees. I first, when I first thought that was, yeah, I wonder if we could kind of, you know, get rid of that and do something, something else there. Um, but I've really come to understand and appreciate, you know, what a great model manufactured homes can be. We just call them mobile home parks, which is really a misnomer because they weren't mobile and, and they're manufactured offsite and moved there as opposed to stick constructions you talked about. Uh, and they really are a much different thing, but they present some unique uh, issues in terms of financing, because as you pointed out, a lot of times, you know, you don't own the parts of land in which the, the manufactured home sits, but it's still your, still your home. Um, it's harder to get financing, to get you know, capital on those things. Uh, and the finance agency, thanks to um, legislative branch of the government, uh, created the manufactured home community redevelopment program. Um, you know, so we're able to use grants and appropriations that do infrastructure needs. I think that's something um, uh, you know, because a lot of times if they're underfunded, under not sufficient capital um, uh, uh, acquisition of parks so that the, the parks can actually be owned by the manufacturer, the homeowners, as opposed to somebody off site who just owns the property and maybe has minimum interest in investing in it. So uh, I'm, I'm totally on board with you on that. And I think that's really an area that we, um, you know, we have expanded in the time. I've been on the board for seven years. 
we've made tremendous strides. Um, so I don't know if we were doing anything or very few things with that when I first started. In the last few years, we've really picked up the pace of that and done some interesting things in our last funding cycle. Um, there were funds there to improve infrastructure, roads, sanitary sewers, you know, some really basic things in some manufactured home parks around the state. So I, I'm excited about doing more of that. Yeah, we are too. Uh, you know, there, there's so many different pieces to the puzzle when it comes to housing. Um, they're all important. Um, you know, for me right now in this point in time, it's about capacity. Um, because we are short of housing units and that jacks up the price and, and we're mm -hmm. getting farther and farther away from affordable. Um, right. But I am ranting. You you know that better than <laughs> no. anyone probably no. being on the board. But um, I appreciate your time and, and thank you. I can tell you're passionate about housing. Um, Does it show? <laughs> yes, it, it's, a, it's a good quality. Um, but thank you for your time um, and, and thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Spears too, he, he left before I could thank him too, but I appreciate you guys both serving on, on the board and uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you, Senator, get, get home safely today. Thank you. Well, next members, we will go to uh, Commissioner Hull and uh, start to unpack the governor's uh, request for a supplemental budget. Commissioner, are you, uh, are you ready to go? I, uh, I am ready to go, and uh, uh, Chairman, that's largely because of uh, the fabulous team I have, uh, Dan Kitzberger and Ryan Bontrog, who were able to work uh, with Joel yesterday and uh, and prepare a presentation to walk through uh, the Walls Flanagan budget recommendations as a report uh, uh, with respect to housing. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to do this today. I um, The... The proposal, next slide please, Dan. Uh, you know, the proposal is, um, is significant and it's important and, it's, uh, and it is diversified in order to be able to attend to the many housing needs uh, that we have across the state and the different types of things that we've just been talking about with my, uh, with my incredible board members. I, um, so, it really looks at um, the opportunity in the in the appropriations to complement what we have in the bonding bill. The bonding bill was 250 million of housing infrastructure bonds and 60 million for public housing preservation to complement that with um, new investments over three years from the uh, from the general fund. I, um, so when you take it all together, it would be an increase over three years of 719 and a half million dollars. And if you think about that relative to just uh, our current uh, uh, base level, about 126 million for the biennium, these are significant investments uh, to build and preserve more homes, to increase housing stability for people uh, who don't enjoy that, and to strengthen and support home ownership. So I'm gonna go over these uh, in a little bit of detail. I, um, and I think the most important thing that I just want to say is that, you know, I think we all agree that the shortage of units and the shortage of units that are available to folks who make the least uh, or, or to, to moderate income uh, potential new, new homeowners, it's really a, a, a driving force in what's happening in so many regards across the state. I, um, you know, I mean, this is impacting an employer's ability to recruit and retain new employees in certain communities of the state. This impacts uh, homeless or highly mobile students who are moving uh, so many times during the year that they're changing schools. Uh, but it also you know, impacts the student who's sitting next to that student in school. Uh, you know, it's, it's disruptive to the whole classroom. Uh, you know, I think the pandemic really proved out how our housing stability uh, can be a big factor in our health. And certainly, you know, that's really true for aging Minnesotans in terms of their ability to, to, to grow old where they want to grow old uh, in, in a home setting that supports a healthy aging. So as we think about these investments, I am just ever mindful of the fact that when we don't meet the housing needs of Minnesota, it has kind of this, uh, 
effect on so many other parts of, of, our, of our lives. And so getting housing rights to me just seems fundamental. Um, and the opportunity that we have uh, with the surplus is kind of a once in a, once in a career, maybe even once in a generation uh, opportunity to do this. I, um, so uh, again, you know, it doesn't really matter where I travel or who I talk to in the state. Uh, th these needs uh, come up everywhere. And it's really a lot of both ends. Uh, to be able to balance uh, many competing priorities, all of which are real. So new construction and preservation, rental and home ownership, uh, deeply affordable housing and market rate housing in greater Minnesota, homelessness prevention and home ownership development, rental assistance and down payment assistance. And with this budget proposal, we're able to, to do uh, both and. So let me just start next slide with just kind of a high level walkthrough. Uh, we've got a number of different line items um, in your budget uh, that are touched here. And this slide just uh, breaks out uh, how that goes. These are the fiscal year 2023. So this is money that would be available just in the, in the next fiscal year uh, uh, cycle. And you see that it's spread across a whole bunch of different programs, uh, both the production and preservation programs as well as home ownership and the housing stability programs. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk through them just in a little bit more detail. Uh, first, with regard to building uh, and preserving more homes, uh, the Economic Development and Housing Challenge Program. Uh, it's a 25 million increase uh, in the next fiscal year and a 30 million increase in the next biennium. Uh, compare that to the enacted um, budget. And this is, you know, one of the programs that allows us to be responsive to what local communities say they need. Um, it's, it's a program that lets us do uh, the consult through the consolidated RFP on both the multifamily and the single family side, just have communities and developers come to us with, with what they want to do. And, and it's got the nimbleness to be able to, uh, to, to do a variety of things. Uh, the priority for the funding is on increasing rental and home ownership housing opportunities in communities where the lack of housing is impacting job growth, as well as providing down payment assistance to first time home buyers through community based nonprofit organizations uh, and through local units of government. The next one is the Workforce and Affordable Home Ownership Program. You'll see the increase for uh, 2023. Is, yes. If we could go back to that, the challenge sure. program a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a breakdown on those um, estimated housing opportunities? Are those rehab? Are they new units? What What is that 1225? I know one of the things, sir, that my team is gathering right now is that you had asked for uh, us to quantify this going back to 1999. Um, that is a, a little bit of a further look back. Uh, than what the agency usually does. So it's just taking us a little bit of time uh, to get that all organized. But per your request, we'll be breaking it out by uh, by type by year. So you'll have access to that. It's, the short answer is it's different every year uh, because we fund based on proposals that come in through that year's funding cycle. Um, so some years we're a little heavier on the preservation side. Sometimes we're a little heavier on the new construction side. And then we tend to try to, uh, to be balanced in terms of uh, what goes into the single family side and what goes into the, the multifamily side. But you'll see that when we get the, uh, the, the breakout data to you. And uh, I'll see if I get a, a text here momentarily for Dan or Ryan. I would be looking over my shoulder if I were sitting in the hearing room to just get a sense of the timeline for uh, getting it to you. But I know we're working hard on that right now. Next slide then, sir, is that okay? So the Workforce and Affordable Home Ownership Program. Yeah, this is um, uh, a, a very significant increase uh, to this program when you compare it to the enacted uh, base budget, which is just a half a million dollars. I, um, and this finances home ownership development grants to cities, tribal governments, nonprofit organizations, cooperatives, community land trusts. Uh, for the development of workforce and affordable home ownership projects. I, um, you know, it, this can be used for uh, the actual development costs. This can be used for rehab. 
this can be used for land development uh, as well as manufactured home community infrastructure. And uh, the level of this recommendation would create an estimated 900 homes over the course of, of three years. So a significant increase compared to what, uh, what we're able to produce today. I am, um, and something that I know that the, that the home ownership advocate- I'm sorry, to, about. I'm sorry to interrupt yes, again. Uh, Senator yep. Rosen has a question. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, um, perhaps you could address this for all of the, the, the breakouts and all the, the, the supplemental budget. How much is, is it a 50-50 split, Metro versus rural? And how was the breakup if there's uh, estimated 900 homes over three years? How's that going to look throughout the whole state? Commissioner? Uh, Chairman and Senator Rosen, a, a lot of this has to do with uh, who makes proposals to us. So we fund things either through separate RFPs for some of these targeted programs or through our consolidated RFP. Uh, we're always looking at the split between uh, Metro and Greater Minnesota. I uh, appreciate that I uh, enjoyed the opportunity to put this money out because of you and that you represent the whole state. Uh, I do have some concerns about, uh, about developer capacity in certain parts of greater Minnesota and being able to have uh, a robust number of competitive proposals. Uh, but that is something that our staff is always working on uh, in between RFPs to really try to highlight this for uh, maybe cities that haven't come in before or to uh, get developer interest in parts of the state where we're not seeing the volume of proposals, but certainly something that the agency tracks closely and that uh, we're very mindful of in selections. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I think Senator Rosen has a follow-up. I do, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, um, to that, is there, and this is maybe an elementary question, but is there um, the ability to track, number one, if there is an area that is kind of a desert, uh, is there a, a program where you go out and explain some of these programs? Perhaps they don't even know that there are these programs available um, through the department and how do they even go to apply? I mean, they're, they're just, it seems to be more relevant and everybody's aware of it in the metro area, but in greater Minnesota, I, I wonder, I just trying to figure out what their capacity is and how we can help that capacity. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Chairman and Senator Rosen, for the question. It, it is certainly something that the agency has has worked on uh, hard for a long time, and uh, you know, I think uh, the legislature uh, can be a great uh, spokesperson for these programs, fund them, and uh, you know, in service to the people uh, of of the whole state and to your districts. And you know, some of the line items that we'll talk about are ones that have been created specifically for Greater Minnesota or they're specifically targeted to uh, smaller towns and communities. I, um, you know, I think uh, some of my board members last week talked about the regional uh, housing forums that we do with the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, uh, listening sessions, but also where we kind of present on the array of programs that we do. We, we work with the, uh, the League of Minnesota Cities and uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties, and we, we, you know, we attend housing conferences and, you know, really do try to promote this. Um, you know, for some cities that haven't gotten involved before, just introducing them to other cities who have applied for and used our funds. Uh, similarly, our work with the tribes to just, uh, you know, because sometimes you can learn better from an entity that's more like you. Uh, and so trying to, you know, make sure that people uh, meet and know others uh, who have done this ahead of them so that they have the opportunity to understand that. We've also done some work on really trying to uh, simplify some of the application processes. Um, you know, the work that we do with small uh, public housing agencies and housing and redevelopment agencies. I mean, some of these in small towns are pretty small shops. And you know they don't have one person who's just a professional grant writer. Uh, so really trying to make sure, um, yeah. Even I think learning about the the technology technology limitations of of some of these smaller shops. Just been really mindful of that in our work. I, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, for me, I think one of the gifts of being the housing commissioner is having the opportunity to travel through the state. It's something that I've missed. I've been able to do as much over the last two years, but I've gotten out whenever I can. 
and really just appreciating that that in even some of the smallest towns, a 20 unit workforce housing development can be game changer as it relates to an agricultural business uh, or a small manufacturing uh, uh, plant in that area. So I certainly think that uh, making sure that these types of programs, people understand that they're not just meant for the, for, you know, for the cities. I know, you know sometimes some of the programs like the federal housing tax credit, you know, they might be easier to do on a larger scale, right? Because the complexity of the financing tool themselves makes it you know, more efficient to do something larger. But that's the real beauty of the appropriated programs that a lot of them are really designed and tailored to, to work in small communities. And we'd be happy to um, have my team uh, just pull out a map uh, for you, Senator Rosen, and the way in which these investments have come to come to work in your region. Thank you, uh, Commissioner and, and Senator Rosen for the thoughtful question. Um, please continue, Commissioner. Well, it's a perfect lead into slide eight. I, um, which is the Greater Minnesota Workforce Housing Development Program. Um, it's, it's, it's all in the name, right? I mean, this is an appropriated line item that was really designed to get at uh, the specific workforce housing needs in Greater Minnesota. And um, it really tends to, to target uh, smaller uh, towns and communities. I, um, you know, if we had this level of investment uh, with the governor's recommendation, uh, we believe we could do an estimated 865 new units of housing in greater Minnesota over the course of three years. And so uh, we wanna attend specifically to the, to the unique housing needs in greater Minnesota. This is the type of line item that's intended to do exactly that. Next slide. Um, we're operating in an environment right now where uh, the things that are driving the cost of construction mean that developers, um, when they first come to us with a proposal between then and when it's closing time to actually start getting the shovels on the ground, they're seeing costs go up. I, um, the, uh, the ability to be able to just fill the gap so that a deal can get closed and get started with construction is really, really important. Um, you know, I, you know, I think a lot of speculation about inflation, and I'm not somebody who, who wants to do that. But the ability in uh, the next fiscal year to just have some flexible financing for capital costs to allow us to make sure that where we have, for example, housing infrastructure bonds, but there's gap financing, uh, that we're able to get in there and, and fill those gaps is is really important right now. I um. We saw an increase in the cost of construction materials of 17% compared to the year before that in the last year. I, um, so this type of, of funding is a, is a one-time opportunity to just deal with the reality of what's happening with construction costs uh, today. Uh, uh, board member Clausen talked a lot about naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, Dan, next slide, please. Um, I mean, this is an area where the agency has done um, some work uh, in partnership with the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, but we tend to have most of our preservation work be focused on federally assisted buildings, uh, that, that are doing preservation in federally assisted buildings is what allows us to keep those federal dollars in our communities across the state. But in the so-called naturally occurring affordable housing, um, that doesn't have any federal subsidy. And yet we know uh, what happens when those um, types of lower rent, uh, older buildings in communities, uh, if they get uh, converted to higher rent place, uh, places, then people are displaced. So the proposal here is for $100 million in 2023 to really help the agency uh, do more in preserving uh, this uh, so-called naturally occurring affordable housing. And, you know, it's a really a cost effective way. Preservation is just always a cost effective way to be able to keep units that are uh, lower cost in the market. And, um, yeah, and sadly, there's just too many instances, too many projects that we could point to uh, where those affordable units got, 
got upgraded and therefore people got press, priced out. With about $100 million, we estimate that we could preserve uh, about 2,850 homes. So a significant investment, but uh, a, you know, a significant return for that investment. I want to turn then to our, our housing stability uh, programs and, and the work that we do around housing stability and homelessness. Next slide, please, Dan. Uh, here are the, the governor's recommendations for the next fiscal year and the next biennium. And again, you can see that these are uh, substantial uh, investments compared to the existing enacted budget. I, um, uh, this includes, uh, it's been, a, uh, a, I think, a while since there's been a significant increase to the state's housing trust flow. Um, and this is a program that helps us provide uh, rental assistance to ind individuals and families, many of whom uh, are experiencing homelessness or very, very low income. Um, and it helps us, you know, uh, complement uh, you know, the federal rental assistance programs, I think you hear frequently that, uh, that federal rental assistance is one of the few federal programs where you can meet all the eligibility requirements, uh, but you're lucky to be on the waiting list. Uh, only about uh, one in four or in some communities, one in five people who are eligible for federal rental assistance get it. I, um, uh, this level of funding would provide housing assistance to an estimated uh, 1,500 households each year, and uh, we think it's a, it's a good time to, to really grow those investments. Uh, the next slide uh, is the uh, Homework Starts With Home program. Uh, we, yes, we, sir. We do have a question. We have a couple questions. Uh, first, we have Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, just a quick one. If you could quickly just explain to us uh, how the Housing Trust Fund Rental Assistance uh, proposal and then the family homelessness prevention assistance program uh, differ. I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Commissioner. Uh, th thank you, Chairman and Senator Darkworth, for your question. I um the so first of all, they interplay in different ways uh, in different programs. So there is some compatibility across them. I am um, and homework starts with home is actually a great example of that because homework starts with home. Kind of marries the type of things we do with family homeless prevention and the types of things that we do with the housing trust fund. But the easiest way to think about it is that the housing trust fund uh, works a lot like traditional federal rental assistance. Um, you uh, pay 30% of your income towards rent. Uh, you have a rental agreement uh, with uh, a rental property. And uh, it allows you to be able to afford the rest of your life by having the housing trust fund pay uh, the remainder of the rent. I, um, and that's, uh, that's kind of basic rental assistance. If you move ahead to slides, I think, to the Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program, this is can be a whole range of activities uh, that are available to help people, as the name says, prevent becoming homeless in the first place. Uh, so it can be uh, both just the helper as well as uh, the financial assistance needed to help people be able to uh, avoid homelessness. Uh, it's used for something uh, that is called rapid rehousing. People who uh, need help uh, getting into uh, back into housing or into different housing. Uh, they don't need long-term assistance. Uh, they just need uh, short-term help in order to kind of get uh, back on their feet economically. And so the Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program is a bit more nimble in terms of being able to be responsive to the housing challenges that different families are facing at different times. Does that answer your question, Senator Duckworth? Yes, thank you very much. And then I skipped over the slide, which is the homework starts with home program, which is slide 13. Thanks, Dan, for keeping up with me. I appreciate that. I, um, you know, it's, it's important to realize that on any given day, about 8,000 school-aged children are identified as homeless or highly mobile in school districts across the state. Uh, schools keep track of that uh, because kids are eligible to stay in their 
homeschool, um, even if their family is uh, stay, stay, staying in a shelter in the next town over or something like that. So it's, it allows us to have a sense of how many school age kids are, um, are, their families are dealing with housing instability. And it's important to just understand that that's um, 1,400 schools and 300 school districts uh, reported from 77 of 87 uh, counties in Minnesota. What we're uh, wanting to do with Homework Starts With Home, and I, I need to work on the naming a little bit, is that we know that this also impacts um, kids who are pre-K, um, not just kids who are K through 12. And so this would be an expansion of the program to kids who are pre-K and to pregnant moms. I, um, you know, sadly, um, the age at which a person is most at risk of experiencing homelessness is zero. Um, being born into homelessness and, uh, you know, the ability to provide housing stability uh, for a family at the time that they give birth is just so important. So that's what we're looking to do uh, here. And again, it's kind of a, a, a blending of what we do with Housing Trust Fund and the Family Homeless Prevention. It can be direct housing assistance, uh, but also just some of the other supports that people need uh, in order to achieve that housing stability. And this level of funding, we estimate would provide assistance for 1,425 families. So we touched on the Family Homeless Prevention Assistance Program, I think in the interest Senator, of time. I, I think Senator Deems has a question on slide 13. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, uh, last year you had mentioned that uh, data was being collected regarding the performance and benefits of the Home Work Starts With Home program and that a report on the program would uh, soon be, be forthcoming. And I'm just curious if that report has been done and if so, when we'll receive it and if it has not been done, when it is expected to be done. Commissioner? Uh, Chairman and Senator Dames, uh, thank you for the question. I will get back to you with a specific answer to that. Um, I just wanna make sure that, uh, that Dan and Ryan uh, get, get the specifics on that and get back to you. Yes, we would look forward to hearing your answer on that when you get that information. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dames. Commissioner, are we on slide? Uh, 15, I think, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I, um, I am very much looking forward to being with you in person soon. I, um, and I'm very much looking forward to having Dan and Ryan flanking me uh, so that we can do the real time back and forth that I haven't been able to do uh, uh, from my home. I, uh, I had actually thought about coming in in person today to be able to present uh, this, but I didn't want to put pressure on my board members to come in person. So, uh, but I do look forward uh, to being with you in person soon. So thanks for just putting up with uh, I, I, some of the sure I think comments. Senator Dames has a follow-up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Commissioner. You're certainly welcome to come and join us. Uh, uh, this is an open meeting and you certainly are welcome to come. You don't need to do it hybrid. We would appreciate if you would come with your team members and join us. I think it makes for a, a much better understanding uh, of these presentations. So uh, the next time we ask you and I'll be looking forward to having you here in person. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Dames. Commissioner? Yeah, uh, Chairman and Senator Dames, I, we too have been talking about doing it. And again, uh, the only reason I didn't come in person today is I didn't want to put pressure on my board members to feel like they had to come in person uh, because I know that they were juggling a lot of other things. Uh, and as, as Craig said, uh, plus the snow, but uh, I am looking forward to being there and being in person. I, I miss, uh, I miss the, the in-person back and forth. We have, I think, one more follow-up here in, in the in the hearing room. Uh, and, Senator and, James. And thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that, Commissioner. I certainly understand, but even if you can't bring your whole all of your folks over, if you could come over, that would certainly be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Commissioner? Yeah, get, getting my shoes signed up, sir. Uh, my shoes shined up. They, they haven't, uh, they haven't uh, gotten a lot of use in the last two years. So, uh, slide 15. Um, we're pro proposing something uh, new here uh, just for fiscal year 2023, the creation of a landlord risk mitigation fund. This is something that the agency has piloted before. This is something that the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs has been using in their work to end veterans homelessness. Um, uh, sometimes uh, for a property to rent to somebody who has uh, a less than perfect rental past, 
um, there's just some concerns about whether they're taking on additional risk. And what's been proven is that if you can have a risk mitigation fund for, um, for any extraordinary events that would happen, that that has uh, sometimes been just enough incentive for somebody to rent to somebody that maybe they otherwise would not have. And so both the financial guarantee, uh, but also just um, that place to call. Um, if, uh, you know, I mean, a, a property just wants to know that somebody's gonna pick up the phone, um, uh, not on Monday morning, <laughs> maybe, uh, but like at the moment that they're having, that they're having a problem with a, with a renter. And certainly with the tight rental market uh, that we have because of the shortage of, of rental units compared to renters, and this is just a great opportunity uh, to, to help people who just need um, uh, just a little extra support in order to be able to begin to build back a, uh, a stable housing um, uh, history. So this would uh, help us uh, get about 2,000 households, uh, help them find housing, folks who maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to do that. Commissioner, on, on that. Um, is that one-time funding or is that standing up a, a program? Uh, Chairman, that's proposed as a one-time funding. I, um, the, the general operating theory of these programs is that it's an insurance program that doesn't have to pay off very often. So you actually can get uh, quite a bit of traction uh, just by the presence of the fund. And that's, yep. uh, again, we piloted something like that and, and the Department of Veterans Affairs has been doing something like that with their uh, work on any veterans homelessness. Yeah, I, I know it's been successful in the veterans area. I think we have another question back here in the committee room, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Uh, this would be to help with the rental, but does it also include the damage deposit when they do the rental? Commissioner? I am um, just thinking for a moment, uh, Chairman and Senator Dames. And it seems to me that it, uh, the mitigation fund is really more tied to kind of the insurance policy related to uh, whether or not somebody has the opportunity to rent in a unit. Uh, some of the other housing stability programs could be used for damage deposits. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner and Senator Dames. Uh, on to slide 16. I, um, we're proposing a new line item uh, called strengthening the supportive housing model. I, um, so, uh, you know, those of you uh, who know me know that I have been working on ending homelessness and demonstrating the value of supportive housing, which is an intervention that kind of brings together both uh, an affordable rental unit with the supportive services uh, that people who have some of the complex conditions associated with long-term homelessness need in order to achieve stable housing. One of the things that has always been hard to do is to line up the, they call it the three-legged stool, right? You need capital dollars to be able to construct uh, supportive housing. You need the rent subsidy to make the unit affordable and you need the case management services that help um, an individual be successful in that unit. I, um, there are multiple ways in Minnesota that that case management component uh, that helps people with a mental illness or maybe somebody who's recovering from addiction, somebody who is just um, uh, just has a lot of road miles on from, from living outside and, and maybe a lot of chronic health conditions just to help folks navigate. I, I oftentimes, and, and, and maybe this, I used to always say it's what my brothers would do for me, but having been caregiving for my brother for the last year, you know, it's just kind of, you know, what, what your siblings would really do for you, you know, but for folks that maybe are disconnected from their family. The services side of supportive housing finances has never kind of been solved in a way that is uh, scalable and reliable and sufficient. And 
I believe it's one of the limiting factors in our ability to really make sure that we are um, maximizing the support of housing that we've invested in across the state, but also making sure that we can make progress um, for some folks that are you know, sometimes just need the most intensive services in order to succeed in their homes. I um, Back when I was the executive director at Hearth Connection, working with the legislature and philanthropy, we were able to demonstrate the cost impact of being able to support people, even with the longest histories of homelessness and the most complex problems, the, the, the cost effectiveness of being able to move somebody into a supportive housing environment because of all the other public costs associated with homelessness. Criminal justice costs, people who are constantly in and out of the emergency room, people who have extended hospital stays, um, so that not only does the individual do better, uh, but the, um, the, the public costs are more wisely invested in better outcomes and better care. So uh, what this line item does is, uh, is gives us an opportunity to figure out how to solve for that complex piece to do it in partnership with our friends over at the Department of Human Services in order to really understand the way that our mainstream health and human services programs uh, can and should be paying for some of these supports, but creates a bridge for us to be able to, uh, to, to be able to maximize those services. So it's certainly an opportunity to create partnerships uh, with the behavioral health sector, the healthcare sector, um, other uh, sectors that are, uh, that should be engaged in improving the health of, of, of Minnesotans who have had um, long histories of that. Onto slide 17. Commissioner, if I could on that 16, you keep on going to 17. It, I don't think my question needs to have it up, but um, you know, as you know, we meet with a lot of different groups and uh, nonprofits, et cetera, all, all trying to do good work in, in this field. And I had a, a group in um, asking about supportive services and if we could waive them uh, for, for new projects up to, 50% of EMI, um, and, and we can talk about that off offline, but um, just your thoughts on that. I, I see here where the governor is asking for more resources in that area, and then I have some of the bigger nonprofits asking us to reduce the requirement for supportive services. So any initial thoughts on, on that? Uh, well, well, Chairman, I'm, I'm asking for both too. Um, with the housing infrastructure bond proposal, um, we're asking for a new use to be able to do housing at 50% of area median income or below that isn't supportive housing and isn't senior housing. And so I think that's the same thing, uh, I, I'm guessing, as the folks that we're talking to you. And, yeah, you know, I mean, some folks don't need supportive services, but for folks who do, it's important that we have a more uh, adequate and reliable way of being able to finance those than what exists today. So I would say uh, I wholeheartedly agree, and uh, we need to also deal with the services and supportive housing for folks who do. Thank you. So then uh, just uh, rounding out here on uh, uh, strengthening and supporting home ownership. Um, uh, this is uh, an increase, uh, as you see here on the slide, a substantial increase uh, to down payment and closing cost assistance if you take a look at it over the 2023 20, enacted budget in the 24-25 phase. I, um, uh, you know, this is, as we've talked about so many times here, uh, one of the best tools that the agency has for helping deal with the home ownership gap in Minnesota. Uh, it helps with all those renters who have enough income to be able to afford a mortgage <laughs> don't have uh, the, the, the wealth built up to be able to, to make it through the, the entry door. This is an area the agency has um, quite a bit of experience demonstrating that with the extra assistance, um, that, that this can make a, a huge difference. And uh, at this funding level, it would help an estimated 2,667. I love the precision of that number. Um, an estimated 2,667 households become first-time home buyers over the course of three years. I, uh, so thank you, Chairman, again, for the opportunity to, to present this. I hope that you see um, 
that it really does attend to the wide range of, um, of housing needs across the state. Uh, as I talk to stakeholder groups, I think this is a package that everybody should be able to get excited about. I, um, uh, this isn't a, a, a just one thing solution. Um, we have a, a housing challenge that requires uh, our tackling it from many different uh, angles. And, um, and I guess I'm just, uh, I'm pleased uh, to be uh, uh, here and a part of uh, a, an overall housing and homelessness proposal that's, that's over a billion dollars when you take a look at what's being proposed across all state agencies on the, on the housing and, and homelessness fronts. Obviously the work of Minnesota housing specific to housing finance and housing stability and home ownership is a critical part of that. And happy to take any other questions, sir. Thank you, commissioner. We, we have a question here in the room and then we'll go to Senator Port. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I've got about three, but they're pretty, pretty quick, pretty brief. Okay. Uh, commissioner, thank you again for uh, participating in all the information you're sharing and providing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the housing market in general. Um, and I, uh, if I seem frustrated with the housing market, please don't take it that I'm frustrated with you. Obviously, you're not responsible for that. Uh, but I do fear that uh, some of what we may do at the state level has the potential to contribute to it. Um, and I'll just be very brief in my comments in this regard. So we know that some of the issues we're experiencing right now in the housing market is affordability. Right, the home, the prices of homes continues to increase at a very rapid rate, which carries over to the cost of rents that continue to rise at a, at a pretty rapid rate as well. We know that primarily that's caused by a shortage in inventory, basic supply and demand, right? If we build more units, we can hopefully begin to alleviate that pressure on the rapid appreciation of home prices, as well as the increase we're seeing in rents across the state of Minnesota. So my question is, if I take the number from the slide, uh, one of the first slides of 720 million over the next three years, how much of that goes toward building new units? Commissioner? Uh, uh, Chairman and Senator Duckworth, um, I'm gonna follow up with you because I know that the guys uh, can do that math because they, they have it spelled out there, uh, but I don't have the guys uh, right behind me to lean over and give me the answer to that. And it's a specific question. I want a specific answer for you. So we'll follow up with you. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I appreciate that. Another one for, for you or maybe for them would be how many new units would the governor's proposal create over the next three years? And then and, the, the follow up to that would be, um, you know, if we just got crazy and we took all 720 million or maybe even close to a billion that you described from some of the other uh, sources of, of potential funding, how many units could we create? in the state of Minnesota over the course of the next three years to help alleviate the pressure that folks are feeling when it comes to the prices of homes and the rising rent. Now, I know that's a, a bigger question. You guys might need some time to analyze that or take a look at it. Um, but if we're talking about making a sizable, meaningful dent in the affordability issue we're experiencing across the street, it's tackling that units issue. And I know you understand it and I appreciate your, your candidness in uh, saying that that is an issue we face, but I, I would love to see uh, how it could be impactful when we're talking about these amounts of, of dollars that are being proposed. Thank you. Commissioner, any, any other comments on that? Yeah, uh, Chairman and Senator Duckworth, thank you for that. And, and thank you for the preface as well. I appreciate that. I, um, I do think that we have to think about preservation and new unit creation at the same time, because every time we lose an affordable unit off of the market, um, that is taking us backwards. And so if we don't deal with preservation at the same time that we're dealing with creation, we can't like net net ahead. I, um, so I do think there's a both hand on, on production and, uh, and preservation. I, um, and, and as you'll see when we follow up with some of the detailed information uh, that you had requested last week, um, the it, investment in preservation is a lower cost per unit but we also need to be doing production, uh, which is a higher cost per unit. And so I do think it's a balanced approach. I think hitting this from all angles uh, is, is an important way to get at it. I, um, and I think for folks who are the most precariously housed, uh, making sure that we have the types of housing stability assistance so that we don't have people perpetually falling into homelessness and all the trauma and, and, and extra stuff that causes. So I, I really believe it's a both and, but we have math 
that we can pull together in terms of uh, the average cost of our supporting new production and the average cost of our supporting preservation. And so you kind of take a look at it that way. We'll, we'll get back to you with that. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I think uh, Senator has a follow-up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate um, uh, your thoughts on that. And I would say, as we, as, as we talk about preservation, right, one of the newer coin terms is naturally occurring affordable housing, which really just means the housing that the market's creating, right? That's just a, a, a fancier term to call what the market creates in terms of affordable housing. And one of the things that we can help preserve or create more naturally occurring affordable housing, or just simply more affordable housing based on what the market's doing, is more units. If we create units and thereby stall or decrease or at least stabilize the rates at which the prices of homes are appreciating by double digits year after year, well, then all of a sudden we found we will find we are preserving and or creating more affordable housing or more NOAA housing. So I uh, hear what you're saying. Preservation or, or keeping the units that we do have is extremely important, but also how can we make even more of those units more affordable to more people? So I really appreciate your comments on there. I look forward to figuring out ways we can do that. Uh, Chairman and uh, Senator Duckworth, I, the, uh, the kind of funny parallel is that I guess when the federal government or the state government helps create that affordability, it's kind of considered unnaturally occurring. So uh, our presence there is, you know, brings the public sector in uh, as opposed to it just being a pure private sector activity. But absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more on the, on the goal. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna to go to Senator Port next. She's been waiting patiently. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Commissioner, it's nice to see you. Um, I, I want to thank you and your team for bringing um, this proposal today and going through it. I think the size and sort of breadth of, of the proposal is really encouraging. Um, we have such a need for investment across the spectrum from home ownership to the homelessness prevention um, that you know we have a unique opportunity in this moment to really make a, a big dent in. And so I'm, I'm encouraged to, to see this and and thank you for bringing it and answering questions. I'm sure we'll have a lot more questions for you as we move through this session. Um, one question I had, uh, going back to the strengthening supportive housing piece, is that would the Bridges program fall into that, a, a program like that that helps uh, you know, stability for folks going through a, a mental health crisis? Is that considered our, you know, part of that program or would that fall in a different bucket? Make sure. Uh, Chairman and Senator Fort, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. So Bridges uh, is really kind of more like the housing trust fund. It's um, it, it's the rental assistance piece, even though it's specifically targeted to people with a serious mental illness. I, um, it's an originally designed for people who were on the waiting list for a housing choice voucher, that it was a bridge to their being able to get that housing choice voucher. I think probably the assumption is, is that if somebody needed case management uh, associated with managing their behavioral health condition, that they would be getting that through more traditional uh, county managed case management programs. So the, I put bridges in the, uh, the rental assistance or operating subsidy category of the three types of funding capital operating and services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have, I have a follow up if that's all right. Um, just, I think that, that that exactly highlights the need for the uh, additional investments in the supportive housing because I, you know, as I've worked with folks who are going through the Bridges program, some of what they talk about is how difficult it is to also find and access and stay on top of all of the other supportive services they need. So, you know, probably because there's not enough supportive housing out there, the Bridges program was the best fit for them. But um, that increased need to really have more opportunity for folks who need housing stability, but also need access to supportive services is, I, I'm really glad that that's included in this budget because it, it's something I've heard consistently um, and, and something we need to address. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Senator Port. I, I guess I had two things that I, I and I, I think one of them you're probably going to have to get back to me on. Um, one has to do with uh, the governor's supplemental budget. How much of the budget is for financing or loans and how much is for grants? 
So if we could get a breakdown over that billion dollars, um, and then of that, how much will be coming back to the agency in, in either principal or interest? Um, so if we, could, if we could get some clarity on that, uh, that would be wonderful. And I'm, I'm gonna go back to kind of what my mission's been the, the last few years on, on the home ownership side and closing that equity gap. So with this governor's plan, how much are we gonna move the needle uh, for home ownership and, and closing that equity gap? Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Chairman, for both questions. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the vast majority of legislative either bond authorization or appropriations that we put into projects, uh, we use the state's investment as, uh, as the dollars where the agency is not um, seeking to make money. These are, these are state investments. They're oftentimes grants um, or they're forgivable loans. But we also don't know specifically some of these monies can be used for grants or loans. What we can go through and mark uh, which of them are always grants um, or could be grants or loans. And just so you have as a reference, but we actually don't know how to quantify that until we actually attach the dollars to a specific project. So obviously for the ones that we always handle as grants, we always handle as grants, but for the ones that can be used as either, uh, we don't know until it gets tied to a specific project, but we'll figure out some way to just uh, make a table or something that helps think about that. Uh, you know, the, the agency uh, resources uh, tend to come off of uh, the, the lending products that we do in the first time home buyer uh, or the, uh, uh, the home improvement, uh, even less so probably on the home improvement loans, but there are general first mortgage products I, um, that are, uh, that are available to home buyers uh, across the state, as opposed to, uh, to to kind of building that off of these types of programs. But we'll find a way to come back and present that. Um, you asked two questions, sir, and I didn't take notes. What was the second question? The, oh, the home buyers. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I um. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Chairman, we, we've said this before. In Minnesota housing's lending is six or 7% of all mortgage lending in the state. And so even though we are uh, outperforming the rest of the market uh, 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 twofold in terms of our lending rates to home buyers of color, we don't have enough market share that what we do completely moves the needle. Uh, but that said, investments in things like um, the creation of more homes that are affordable and uh, investment in things like the down payment uh, assistance program can substantially um, uh, support, you know, uh, many home buyers and many home buyers of color becoming homeowners. And this is work that's done, you know, one household at a time, uh, you know, one percentage point at a time. I think figuring out how to move the whole market um, is really. I feel like that's um, like like that is the big question. That is the big question. Is like how do we impact the whole kind of mortgage industry to be able to perform at a level that that Minnesota Housing has demonstrated with intentionality and in these types of tools? You can really make a substantial difference. And um, but I think that at Minnesota Housing, uh, I don't think that we feel like we can do that alone, but we feel like these are really important pieces. And they're also important ways to demonstrate to the private market that with these types of activities, you really can make a difference. And if we were all in it together and all working hard on this together with the same types of results as we have, we could be moving. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, members, I am gonna pull the plug on our today's hearing. It is past time and, and some of us have to drive in the snow. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time, uh, Commissioner. Thank you again for, for being here and members for your thoughtful questions. Uh, we will be uh, starting to dig into uh, a rent control at the next hearing. 
Um, so we'll we'll have a I'm sure a lively discussion on that. Uh, so with that, we are adjourned for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much.